Another story that you probably didn't hear in Sunday school or maybe didn't read at the dinner table all too often is in uh, Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus is a book that many of us tend to look over quite a bit because there's a lot of technical rules and such in there. There's a few stories and uh, there's one right here that's not the most pleasant, but we're going to read it. Leviticus 24, 10 through 23. Now the son of an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father went out among the Israelites, and a fight broke out in the camp between him and an Israelite. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name with a curse. So they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shemelith, the daughter of Dibri the Danite. They put him in custody until the will of the Lord should be made clear to them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the blasphemer outside the camp. All who heard him are to lay their hands on his head, and the entire assembly is to stone him. Say to the Israelites, If anyone curses his God, he will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him, whether an alien or native-born. When he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. If anyone takes the life of a human being, he must be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, whether he is whether whatever he has done must be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has injured the other, so he is to be injured. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution, but whoever kills a man must be put to death. You are to have the same law for the alien and the native born. I am the Lord your God. Then Moses spoke to the Israelites. And they took the blasphemer outside the camp and stoned him. The Israelites did as the Lord commanded Moses. So the Bible has a lot of stories that are kind of eye-opening. This one here might strike us as vicious or harsh or over the top or just kind of bizarre. Why would God include that in his word? And where is Christ in here? And where is grace in this passage? It doesn't really seem like there's either of them. Uh, But as I was studying this passage, I I got really excited because it kind of all came to me at once. And so I'm looking forward to sharing with you what, what I have here. But let's look at it. What, what exactly happened? In verse 10, that's, pretty, that's what most of it is. In verse 10, Now a son of an Israelite mother, an Egyptian father, went out among the Israelites, and a fight broke out in the camp between him and an Israelite. So we have a half-Israelite who fought with another Israelite in public. In some of the other translations, it actually says he went out among the people, and then the fight broke out. So this was a public event. There was a a fight in the town square. And then in this angry fight, the half-Israelite blasphemes the name. That would be God's name. He blasphemes the name. We're not told any details about what that was about. It says he blasphemed with a curse. Now, again, we don't know exactly what he said or, or how that constituted blasphemy, but we're told that he blasphemed the name with a curse. And then in verses 15 and 16, there's kind of an interesting turn. It says, Say to the Israelites, If anyone curses his God, he will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. 
the entire assembly must stone him. And it goes on, no matter whether he is an alien or native born, when he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. Now both Jews and Gentiles, just for a brief thought here, both Jews and Gentiles are sinners. They are all guilty of profaning God's holiness. Both Jews and Gentiles alike were all guilty of profaning God's holiness. We've disgraced or dishonored God. So it says that native born or alien, it doesn't matter. It says in the New Testament quite a few times, God does not show favoritism. So anyone who blasphemes is guilty. And it's fascinating that this person who made the blasphemy had an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father. An Israelite mother and an Egyptian father. So this was a mixed, a mixed marriage, really. And we don't know anything about the Egyptian father or, or anything like that. But one thing that did come to mind is that when you have a mixed marriage where a husband and wife, they don't have the same faith in God, that produces consequences not just for them, but for the kids even. There's a, a book that I read recently that looked over all sorts of surveys and statistics collected over lots of periods of time and they looked for certain trends and such and then they said this in one of their findings the most important factor predicting religious retention whether you stay in the faith or not is whether a person's family of origin was religiously homogenous the same and observant or not. Children of mixed marriages are much more likely to leave the faith within which they were raised. Much more likely. Moreover, children of mixed marriages are more likely to have no religion or to attend religious services rarely, even if they remain nominally, nominally affiliated. So this mixed marriage thing, for those of you who are not married yet, who you marry is incredibly significant. It's not just for you, it's also for your kids. So your faith has to match. Not, not somebody who's kind of casually a Christian, but somebody who's really passionate about God just like you are. And then at the end, God commands everyone to bring the blasphemer outside the camp, lay their hands on his head, then stone him to death. God commands everyone to bring the blasphemer outside the camp, lay their hands on his head, and then stone him to death. Outside the camp, that is code for unclean, unholy, or cursed. Last week, we had that mentioned also. We we're also studying Leviticus. Outside the camp is where you threw the unholy things. Things that were cursed. And so here we have a case where just mere words mean death. Just words mean death. And we should pause here to think about how often the Bible talks about our words and how important they are, how critical they are. We use our words casually and, and lightly, but the Bible says a lot about how we use our words. So, for example, 
Proverbs 12, 18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. And Jesus said this, you brood of vipers, he's talking to obviously the Pharisees and hypocrites, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Words are, are very important. Very important. And then there's this section beginning at verse 17, where it's almost like there's, we're talking about something else now. Now it talks about you know, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, animal for animal. Why would that be inserted here? Well, these verses, 17 through 22, is kind of saying the punishment for blasphemy is the same as the punishment for murder. The punishment for blasphemy is the same as the punishment for murder. Now, if that's, that's maybe, I don't know, that, that hits my mind a little, a little strangely. Uttering a couple words is just as bad as killing someone. Just a few words it can be just as bad as actually killing somebody. And it goes on. And we know from the New Testament as well as the Old Anyone who breaks one part of the law is guilty of breaking it all. It's God's commands, they, they all kind of go together. They all fit together into what glorifies Him. And if you pull, pull one thread out, the whole thing starts to unravel. In Galatians 3.10, it says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. It is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. And then James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So here we have this blasphemer who's going to be stoned and killed because of these few words that he's spoken. And then it's giving the same punishment for murder. And then it talks about other sins here. All sin is, is together. There's one law. There's one standard. And when we break that, the punishment is clear. Now, all of Leviticus, the whole book, in all sorts of different ways, all of Leviticus basically is pointing to God's holiness is a big deal. God's holiness is a big deal. Disgracing the God of the universe who gives us life and every breath that we take, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And there's all these laws because it's such a big deal. And all sin is blasphemy in that it dishonors or hurts God. All sin is blasphemy in, because it dishonors God, it hurts God. So fairness dictates that we get the blasphemer's death. In all fairness, this half-Israelite 
who's stoned to death, that should be us. Because we've all sinned. We all have the propensity to sin, moreover. And we're guilty. Just like he is. If you profane and dishonor God, then you deserve death. The wages of sin is death. As it says in Romans. Now, if our sins are hidden, you know, some of us some of us have a little bit of an advantage here. Some of our weaker points, you know, it's easier to keep those hidden. If our sins are hidden or socially accepted, we might be tempted to feel superior to those other sinners, like abortionists or murderers or rapists. We're not as bad as they are. It might be easy to say that. So it's very easy to fall into this trap of going around being on the outside. You know, a good, nice Christian who does the good, nice Christian things. But on the inside, there's some reprehensible stuff. If you've been watching the news at all lately, there's probably a couple people that you would recognize. There's a Dr. Kermit Gosnell. Maybe you've heard of him. And there's a guy from Cleveland named Ariel Castro. Maybe you know the news stories behind that guy. Both very reprehensible characters who've done just awful things. And yet, this, I was reading the news here, one of Ariel Castro's people in his family, his uncle, he said he, he just seemed like such a great guy. It says, we only knew one Ariel, my sweet nephew. He was a sweet, happy person, a musician. We didn't have the slightest idea of the second person in him. In the same way, you and I, we can have certain sins that might be socially acceptable or sins that we might be able to not think about, kind of push to the side. But when you really look at our lives, you find some reprehensible stuff. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All sin deserves death, and we are no better than the vilest sinners. We are no better. Those are the two people I just mentioned. We are no better. We are in no place to feel superior to them when it comes to what we've done. At least according to what the Bible says. It's all sin. And it all dishonors God. So, even things that we might not think too much of. Things that we might look the other way from or maybe even just kind of chuckle about. But something like holding a grudge or bitterness against someone. About demanding our way or with the old Dutch word, being a steethkop. Did I say that right? Did I? Okay. Manipulating others to get them to do things your way. How about coming to church every week and just doing it as a ritual and having it not really mean anything to you? Being here for the wrong reasons. How about calling yourself a Christian and then believing that being a Christian means things that you do, not belonging to Christ. 
How about greed and envy? And we conveniently label it as hard work or ambition. Or gluttony. And we consider that maybe a healthy appetite. There's all these things that if we take a look at our lives, we should maybe look twice. Especially when we think about looking down on other people, we need to remember that there's a plank in our own eye first. So anyways, where is Christ in this story? Where is their grace in this passage of Leviticus where some guy gets stoned to death for some words that he said? Well, to put it as simply as possible, when Christ came, Christ became the blasphemer for us. Christ became the blasphemer. Christ had an Israelite mother, but not an Israelite father. And he grew up in Egypt. Mary was his mother. And it says in the Bible that Right after, or shortly after he was born, they fled to Egypt because they were, they were going to search for Jesus to kill him. So Jesus spent a number of years in Egypt. Not only that, Jesus died on the charge of blasphemy. Just like this guy. When Jesus was standing before the Sanhedrin, they got in his face and says, I charge you I, by oath of the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. Then the high priest tears his clothes. He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, you've heard it for yourselves. What do you think? He's worthy of death. Christ was also taken outside the camp as someone cursed by God. When they crucified him, they took him outside of the city. Galatians 3.3 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So Christ was taken outside and killed so that we would be set free. And that laying of hands on this guy's head. All of us have, in a spiritual way, laid hands on Christ so that our guilt would pass to him. We all have laid hands on Christ so that our guilt would pass to him. Isaiah 53, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He died for us. We took our sin and put it on him. And he became the blasphemer. And all of us have killed Christ with our sin. This guy, it says the entire assembly is to stone him. Everyone. And all of us have killed Christ with our sin. It was our sin that put him on the cross. He went there because of us. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds we are healed. So we are not good, or we are not Christian because we sin less than other people. We are not good or Christian because we sin less. We are Christians only by passing our blasphemy to Christ who died so that we could live. We are Christians only by passing our guilt, our blasphemy onto him so that we would live and he would die in our place. Christ became the blasphemer that we were. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians, it says that. By the one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy in Hebrews 10. And it goes on. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. So we don't need to stone anybody anymore. Because Christ became the blasphemer for us. And so that's why he said, if any of you is without sin, cast the first stone. So we are as good as murderers and rapists, and yet we're right with God because of grace in Jesus Christ. Our conduct, we are as good as the worst of the worst. And yet, with God, we're okay because of the grace in Jesus Christ. And uh, there's a minister that I follow on Twitter, Tulian Chavidian, Chavidian, actually. Psalm 103.12, he says, is the most difficult verse to believe. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. Christ became the blasphemer for us. And we are saved. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God in heaven, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be the blasphemer for us, to die in our place when we were the guilty ones. Oh Lord, help us to always be thankful for it. Lord, may it change our hearts and our minds. May we not be the ones to cast the first stone or to look down on other sinners or to feel superior to anyone, but to only rely on the grace of that was given to us in your Son. And Lord, help us to look to him for all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.